just to start off, um, aloha mai kako, o aloha lani ko inoa, noho ao magudini. Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome. My name is Aloha Lani. And right now I am in the ancestral lands of the Wiat, known as Gudini, also called Arcada, um, where the home base of Redwood Energy is. And we're going to have a little switch up today on our presentations. We're going to have Brianna start for us. Um, Brianna is the Director of Strategic Community Initiatives at EcoWorks. Um, Brianna is the Director of Strategic and has almost 20 years of experience as an Energy and sustainable Sustainability Program Manager and Administrator in Strategic Business Planning, Organizational Development, Nonprofit Management, Process Improvement, and Project Management. Prior to EcoWorks, she consulted with the Chadwell Group and Headstrong Consulting and graduated from the University of Cincinnati Law School. Thanks, Brianna, for being here. Good afternoon. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. I am in uh, the Midwest in the wonderful state of Michigan, uh, Detroit, Michigan, and uh, city of Detroit. And I appreciate and the honor and the privilege of being able to speak with you today. We're having a little technical difficulties, so I apologize that I'm not on camera, but I'm with you in spirit, and so I will uh, make sure that hopefully we can connect at a later date uh, if we have the opportunity to speak again. But first and foremost, I want to take the opportunity to thank Redwood Energy. Uh, Sean and his phenomenal staff have been so gracious to uh, be supportive, first, of the organization that I'm with, EcoWorks, and the staff uh, at EcoWorks. We have had the opportunity to engage with them and, and learn from all the wonderful things that they do at Redwood. And so just first want to pay uh, honor and that it's a privilege uh, to be able to speak with you today and also with all the other uh, participants and attendees. I thank you for taking the time to listen and have the opportunity to learn from you. And hopefully uh, this session will be one that will be enlightening, we will learn from each other, and we'll have an opportunity to continue to engage and grow in this work. Again, thank you for the introduction. My name is Brianna DuBose. I am with EcoWorks, and today we're going to be talking about lessons learned uh, through equitable community electrification. Uh, my name is Brianna DuBose. I'm the Director of Strategic Community Initiatives at EcoWorks. We have a phenomenal team and staff at EcoWorks of energy analysts, uh, program directors, youth energy leaders, and just a phenomenal group of people that are all committed to sustainability and environmental justice. Today, I'd like to talk about uh, our history of e at EcoWorks, uh, the equity framework that we work from, uh, Detroit's housing conditions, and the needs, benefits, and opportunities for equitable electrification. So EcoWorks has been around since 1981. Uh, we have worked in collaboration with other partners and community-based organizations in Detroit in the metro area for the past 41 years uh, to look at energy poverty, environmental injustice. We work on energy efficiency, weatherization. We provide uh, programs for job training, educational advancement, advocacy, and then consulting. We, over the last 41 years, we have served more than 50,000 individuals. We have worked with 35 different governmental partners. We have over 300 business partners. We have supported green jobs and we currently are working on workforce development to uh, broaden that outreach. And we have provided $30 million in energy savings. Our programs at EcoWorks, we are a well-versed, uh, collaboration of programs that meet community. We have a youth energy squad that helps grow the generation of green leaders uh, by engaging in school districts in the Detroit metro area. We also work with STEM programs uh, in Southeast Michigan, hoping to bring in com combining energy education with uh, opportunities for learning about educational growth, uh, for people to look at careers in the green, economy, learning about environmental sciences, and providing a platform for them to do it with hands-on based practices. 
we have a EcoD uh, program, and this program provides outreach uh, services to communities, teaching about sustainability, providing resources for education, and helping communities to be resilient and uh, allow them an opportunity to have safe and healthy neighborhoods. And last but not least, uh, the Strategic Community Initiatives Program. We have a team that includes myself as well as two energy analysts, uh, Brittany Turner and Henrik Mader, uh, both who are phenomenal uh, advocates as well as consultants with green energy. We look at developing customized solutions for organizations. We work primarily with municipalities within the metro area. We have worked very extensively with the city of Detroit, working on their sustainability action agenda, as well as other municipalities with climate planning and energy plan. Specifically, what we do in strategic community initiatives is that we provide technical support. We look at benchmarking, providing ways to reduce carbon emissions by greenhouse gas uh, inventories. We put together comprehensive energy and climate plans. We look at energy financing options. We've developed uh, revolving in, uh, loan funds with consensus workshops. And we make sure that we go back and work with organizations to provide continuous improvement on energy planning. We also provide project management. We have served as owner's representation. Uh, we do stakeholder coordination, RFP development. We look at financing uh, recommendations and strategies. And we continue to make sure that we evolve in working with con community partners to be able to look at uh, ways to bring projects to life. We also are very, very uh, strong in engagement. This is one of the key components. In order to do the technical work that we do, we make sure that we are able to first put community at the forefront. We want to make sure that we reach out to our constituents, our community partners, people that lived in the community, making sure that energy is brought in a way that is relatable, livable, and tangible. We make sure that we have inclusive and engaging community outreach. We look at ways in which that we uh, can provide training for our community-based partners to be able to help with looking at technologies that will help their communities. And we make sure that we're, we're always being an advocate for ambitious climate planning and energy goal setting. Equity is at the forefront of what we do. We make sure that we are looking at uh, communities that we work in are ones that are impacted the most by uh, climate change. And we work with frontline communities, but we wanna make sure that we're inclusive of all communities, even rural communities, when we look at climate changing, climate change, so that it makes sure that we are being equitable and fair and that we're making a positive change for all of us. The equity framework by which we try to strive is that we look at how do we move equity in a way that we provide a racially balanced uh, approach to climate planning so that everyone gets to need what they need to survive. Usually in frontline communities, they're faced with extreme storms, poverty, uh, heat waves, there's health impacts. We have a lot of flooding in the city of Detroit. Uh, obviously race is a factor and immigration. And so from those standpoints, we need to make sure that we are looking at opportunities by which to bring equity as a framework into all the climate planning that we do. From our perspective, we'd like to look at uh, ways in which to, be, to become uh, equitable. We wanna say our low carbon future, another way of saying mitigation, is that we wanna look for affordable and accessible energy. Oftentimes people in underserved communities, energy is not affordable. We wanna make sure that we're putting in climate solutions that will do our part to cut carbon pollution. And we wanna make sure that we provide opportunities to engage in the clean energy economy. A lot of jobs are being built out of uh, green energy and we wanna make sure that we're bringing in people that are being directly impacted by climate into this new economy, making sure that infrastructure is gonna be put in, but they also learn the tools, what educational opportunities, what other technical opportunities that they can learn to also be part of this new clean energy economy. We want to also prepare for climate impacts, AKA adapt adaptation. We wanna make sure that we're, we're ready for extreme weather. We're looking at you know, the news of the last several days of the impacts of hurricanes, the, the 
forcefulness of, of weather conditions. And we live in the Midwest, we're often faced with snowstorms, changing uh, temperatures, not enough rain, too much rain, too hot. Um, so we're, we're looking at these, these extreme weather conditions that are going to continue to increase if we don't look at ways in which to uh, adapt to the climate change. And then we also are looking at resilient buildings and tr also transit and also infrastructure. Our goals for the city of Detroit and the people that we work with is to make sure that we are thriving and prospering in an equitable green city. We're advocating constantly for affordable quality homes. We want clean connected neighborhoods. And most of all, we want to collaborate to, collaborate to steward the resources that we have. There's a lot of money that we keep hearing is going to be uh, coming down to uh, states from the federal and the state government. And we wanna make sure that we as stewards of our community and the people that we represent in our communities, that we are able to channel that money to the people that are deserved so that we can make their homes and their neighborhoods better places. Speaking of that, I wanna talk about uh, a city that our organization uh, is, is in. In the city of Detroit, most of the housing was built before 1940. Detroit households often pay more for energy and water than they do for housing. The average utility bills are usually higher than what the mortgage rate is for the house. The house is often directly poorly insulated. There's inefficient HVAC. The leaks and plumbing repair costs can be upwards of $200 a year. There are major repair issues that are needed, roofs, gutters, porches, window leaks, asbestos, mold, lead. So you have just conditions that um, really are not the most ideal and are, are impacting people's health and their safety in their neighborhood. Uh, I'm sorry, could you just repeat that stat? Did I understand you correctly, Brianna, that you said that people's utility bills exceed their mortgage bills? Their, their, their rent and some, not some, and some of the mortgage bills, yes. Whoa, we had a lot of conversation yesterday about energy poverty, but that's just extreme. Yes. Uh, continue on, but wow. So two thirds of our population since 1950 has fled the city of Detroit. The reason why I use the terminology fled is because we've had industrialization, white flight to redlining and gentrification. We went from population of 2 million to 639,000 people. Most of the people that have been left behind are people of color. Over 100,000 homes were foreclosed since 2000, and many of which have been sold to developers and investors for 500 per lot or less. Detroiters face extreme utility poverty. Less than 200 Detroiters households receive weatherization annually. This just represents just one out of 1,000 households that are eligible. 75% of households on the waiting list are disqualified due to health and safety issues they can't afford to fix. So we can't even begin to talk about energy efficiency and saving on utility bills, which will help with energy affordability because a lot of people can't get into programs that will help with assistance to help get their homes weatherized in repair so that they can then qualify for energy assistance programs. The result of this is that we have foreclosures, we have water shutoffs, we have energy shutoffs, there are health impacts and there are climate impacts. And all these things impact the quality of life that, that a family will have. Children can be taken out of the home based upon water shutoffs and energy shutoffs. People can't go to work if they're sick. Children are out of school. So you've got uh, issues with uh, truancy and things of that nature because of either being sick or that you know, they don't have the proper support at home to be able to get prepared to come to school or have the utilities in the evening to see to do their homework. So it's, it's a, an extreme problem. One of the things that we've tried to do in the city of Detroit is that we've worked with the University of Michigan and a professor by the name of Larissa Larson from the School of the Michigan Taubman College of Urban Planning developed a vulnerability rating. And it looked at every census tract in Detroit. 
And the rating was based on the number of people 65 years or older, the highest number of people living beneath the poverty line, and also that had the lowest tree canopy. And these zip codes are reflective of the most vulnerable neighborhoods in Detroit. So when we try to look at ways in which we're addressing climate impact and climate change and looking at finding ways to be equitable with climate solutions, we are trying to address these zip codes first because these are the most vulnerable. We also try to look at energy use by sector. When we think about energy use and production of carbon emissions, mostly a lot of people think about just factories because you can see the pollution coming out of the, the smokestacks. And in factories, it uses about 32% of our energy, uh, as well as also including in transportation. So, you know, cars, buses, uh, trucks. We have a lot of uh, factories in the city of Detroit. And those use about 28% of our energy. But half of all that energy is consumed through buildings, both residential and commercial. Thus, why are organization wants to focus on electrification, particularly with household, residential, and multifamily. We want to focus on this because we feel it will lower greenhouse gas emissions, we'll have cleaner air with both indoor and outdoor air quality. Health and outcomes are most important. We really are, are focusing on the health and safety impacts uh, and why we're trying to promulgate for these programs so that we can look at ways in which to improve health outcomes. We want energy efficiency to reduce monthly energy bills for population burden communities. We also want to make sure we're providing resiliency for power during outages. We have uh, the grid in, in Michigan and particularly in Detroit has not been good. Uh, we think there may ultimately finally be some progress of addressing grid outages because it's now finally not only affecting lower income or underserved communities, but it's also affecting the suburbs where you have a higher socioeconomic population. And, and so everyone is now finally being affected. So finally the utility may hopefully try to resolve some of these grid issues, but at the same time, our rates are going up, which is going to imp uh, unfairly impact those already affected by energy burden. And lastly, we want to have an opportunity to add in cooling and comfort. So how do we look at reducing energy cost? Indoor air quality. We had a study a few years ago, probably about four years ago, that was called Project Green Home. And EcoWorks was trying to, it was an initiative where we were trying to address a range of sustainability issues. And we were actually looking at air quality and ways in which to do a study with children, uh, families that were affecting or impacted by asthma based upon mold and, and other poor in air quality uh, in, within their home. And we looked at ways that we could put in uh, better air quality monitoring systems to be able to track the air quality, put in new air filters, and do things that would basically provide for a more healthy and safe lifestyle. What do we mean by building electrification? So when we talked about some of the studies that we've already done with our organization, we're looking at this from a, a standpoint of looking at replacing a central a AC unit with a heat pump and pairing it with a furnace for backup for a dual fuel system. We're also looking at induction stoves to help with air quality. We know that, in, in, uh, that regular gas stoves emit a high emit of carbon emissions. We're looking at, looking at electric dryers, we're looking at smart power strips. We wanna upgrade the electric panel. And we want to prepare the building envelope with insulation and air sealing. The benefits of equitable community electrification, what we want to try to do is to educate re residents. First and foremost, when I emphasize some of the core competencies that our organization had was about community engagement. So we want to make sure that again, that we aren't just coming in using a Band-Aid approach. We wanna make sure we're drawing in communities so that they can learn about what electrification means. What is climate change? What are our emissions? How does it impact them? And with us doing this, how might they start to take ownership in advocacy as well as learning about electrification so that they can champion to have these things done in their communities and in their homes. 
we want to make sure that we're starting to build trust. There's a lot of contractors out there that aren't knowledgeable about the current technologies and that we are trying to, to develop relationships with those contractors so that we can build apprenticeship programs with some of our other community-based organizations to get people between, in, between jobs that are uh, in different educational, whether it's a junior college, a tech, technical program, to learn about uh, future technology so that they can be part of this green economy and help collaborate on electrification projects. We know that electrification is going to be expensive. Natural gas and other fossil fuel energy sources is volatile and so those rates can go up and down. So we wanna make sure that we can figure out how to find efficient electric systems that can help prevent residents from cost increases that they then are underwater and then they can't afford their homes. We wanna make sure as we talked about climate change and the, the changing factors in the environment that we provide access to cooling. If we can replace a furnace with a heat pump, it gives cooling capacity so that homes that previously did not have access to air conditioning can have a more safe environment and a comfortable environment in which to live. Health and safety improvement, if we can install electric systems such as appliances, i.e. induction stoves, we can prevent gas leaks, we can in, uh, lower the indoor uh, uh, air levels, and we can make sure that we are hopefully diminishing uh, health impacts such as asthma. And we want to make sure that we are lowering the energy burden. Heat pumps can lower energy bills for residents. Fuel oil or propane we know are a lot higher, and in some cases they're inefficient with these aging natural gas systems. EcoWorks would like to start, we're, we're on a, a phase of looking at a pilot program and, and we're, we're open to what we call this program because we wanna make it make sense to community. We want it to make sense to contractors. We want it to make sense to municipalities and legislators. So we're right now talking, we're saying equitable electrif electrification program. And that's kind of a tongue twister, but basically we wanna make sure that we are providing access to accelerate residential electrification retrofits through a streamlined process. We want a person or a business owner to be able to come to one place to be able to learn about electrification, be able to get a contractor to help them, and then also be able to provide incentives and programs around financing, grant access to lower the cost of possibly some of the upgrades that they can do. Additional solutions to address barriers to electrification. We talked before about weatherization program. So we know that a lot of people are going through, you know, are deferred, and so they can't get into energy assistance programs because they can't get it, the weatherization completed. So we would like to partner with housing programs and weatherization programs to address deferred maintenance needs. We want to coordinate with frontline community-based organizations. If we can partner with local community-based organizations to expand the reach of this campaign into BIPOC communities and or traditionally underserved communities, we feel that we can bring more people into access for information and thus be able to help, be able to facilitate getting them to programs to get energy efficiency and ultimately move towards electrification and decarbonization. And then we wanna look at inclusive financing and incentives. We'd like to partner with mission aligned financial institutions so that we can look at affordable and accessible financing options and incentives to lower upfront cost. Oftentimes we're in situations where we, even a person that may be able to afford their energy bill can't necessarily afford some of the technology. Heat pump prices are very expensive. Contractor rates are really expensive even just understanding about solar and financing and things of that nature. We really want to make sure that we figure out ways to help support people at all varying levels from those that can't afford it to those that maybe can afford it to those that may provide access to financial opportunities to help support so that we all can ultimately be have homes that are safe and health with electrified, electrical, electrification. I spoke about us looking at drafting an energy concierge program model. The word concierge is a little fancy. Technically what that means is that we'd like to be an energy uh, manager, an energy resource where it's a one-stop shop model, where you can come 
And as a resident, if you're being referred by a, a, a program, an energy efficiency program, if you're a resident that has the means, maybe you're in a community that is really uh, taking up the charge of uh, lowering the carbon emissions footprint and you want to do some things that are really proactive with your community and your home that um, you're able to be able to look at um, ways in which to how do you do that and so first we want to be able to identify an applicant pool and community partners we want to figure out who possibly can come into a program like this and how do we reach out to those people to let them know that there are options to be able to get your home elect electrified we then want to determine a work plan of goals and responsibilities. So we actually are doing a pilot in a community near us in, in Ann Arbor who is very progressive around climate change and looking at ways in which we uh, bring in an intake specialist that will then work with this applicant pool. We would have energy advisors that would help with the uh, assessment of the building and what the needs are with the building. They then would refer that person to a energy auditor who would do a thorough building, anal building analysis. And then from there, look at a whole home plan of what needs to be done to electrify that person's home or small business. After we, we determine you know, what that, that model looks like, we then would try to develop and implement an outreach and engagement strategy. Again, you've got to be able to know what's in the pipeline, what technologies are there, how to dispel some of the myths around uh, climate change and green technology so that people, again, can be advocates for themselves and understand what's there. And for us to make sure that we are working on the, the most up-to-date technologies that are not, it's not just going to be a Band-Aid fix, but a long-term solution in which to help bring in effective change into a person's home. We want to engage contractors. We know that the workforce pool is limited right now to some of the contractors that know about the technologies for electrification. And so we are partnering with other organizations that are looking at workforce develop. Some other organizations that we work with in the city of Detroit have contractor accelerator programs, and they've been very supportive of trying to figure out ways in which that we can get people uh, to have vetted contractors that are invested in this technology and that can do the technology right and that we're leaving the home at once we go into it in a good position. And then ultimately we'd like to establish a resource toolkit so that when a person comes in, that they have access to financing options, they have access to technology, they have access to uh, what programs and incentives and rebates are available in which for them to be able to proceed through this process. But ultimately, we at EcoWorks would be the primary administrator of the program and would help facilitate making sure that we are entrusted with this person or this small business owner throughout the process, making sure that we are advocating on their behalf, helping them find contractors, helping to make sure that the contractors are doing the work that they're supposed to do. And from that, but we also want to leave them with the tools so that they have, that we're transparent, that they have the information needed so that they can become advocates and ambassadors and share with their neighbors about the program and be able to speak from a position of, of knowledge. Having gone through just a high level of some of what we're trying to do in, in the city of Detroit, some of the challenges that are faced with energy burden and energy accessibility and health and safety issues in Detroit, I wanted to just at least provide just kind of an overview of some of the work that we're doing. Sean has been very helpful in trying to help uh, with a, a, a financing uh, plan, uh, looking at how we can achieve this goal of equitable decarbonization and electrification, and looking at how we can figure out how we can start with buildings to be able to provide uh, air conditioning, heating, uh, induction stoves, laundry facilities. But we, we have challenges of really being able to try to figure out um, how do we get financing so that we can put implement a sustainable program? And so hopefully uh, having shared some of what we uh, are interested in doing, some of the things that we have done, that you know, we have an opportunity to learn from others that may have gone through uh, some of these programs that can help um, identify additional opportunities or benchmark best practices. Uh, I've shared contact information, our website, Instagram, and Twitter, and uh, our staff at EcoWorks, any of us would be more than happy to make sure that we uh, follow up with you. 
but would like to open up the floor to uh, address any questions or uh, insights that you'd like to offer. Woo! Yay, Brianna! Great job. Okay, so there are questions. <clears throat> Thank you. <clears throat> and just so you know, it looks like we have unexpected gap for the next 25 minutes. So Brianna, if you're willing to, no, no. We have a speaker. Oh, then who's that? It's going to be Dave Karskotten. Oh, excellent. In place of Guy Lone Child. Okay, does that mean we don't have time for questions for Brianna though? We don't have time, okay. Very, very quickly if you want to. One question, I'll let you do one. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Um, okay, well, Brianna, someone that wants you to share the vulnerability rating, the, the link to the vulnerability rating that you mentioned in your slide deck, if you could put that into the chat, that'd be terrific. And there's some more questions and comments in the chat. I apologize, um, but thank you for going first. And I'm looking forward to working with you. Like we, we need to be on the phone next week and because we need to figure out a strategy to get the IRA funds to you. Right, I appreciate it. Yesterday, it's like, let's do this. Let's do this. All right, thank all right. you all. I appreciate your time. Thank and you, Brianna, you're thank awesome. You.